data junkies welcome back in this particular module we're kicking off a new series where we're talking about two sample hypothesis testing for z and t this introductory video is going to be focusing specifically on introducing the independent samples and in future videos we're going to be talking about two sample confidence intervals assumptions of variance later in another video we'll introduce the paired two sample tests and in future videos we'll talk about non-parametric versions looking at two sample tests for proportions and then calculating effect size and power for the various two sample hypothesis tests that we're working on. Now, so far, we've been testing for significant differences with means or proportions between two groups. And those groups have been focusing on the one sample variety where we have one particular sample group and we're comparing it back to its population. And that came in the form of the one sample Z and the one sample T test. Now we're going to shift gears and we're going to go into two sample mode and two sample mode breaks out into two different families of tests, the paired samples and the independent samples for Z's and T's. Now, now let's go ahead and kick off with the independent two sample hypothesis testing. Pre the question that we're asking here is that is the difference between the statistics large enough to conclude that the populations represented by the samples are different? I want to stress populations samples. These are plural. What we're asking here, but the null, and stating that the populations are the same. The average between two different groups is the same. There's no difference at their parameters at the population level. And we're using two sample groups, one representative of each population, to do our comparisons. Now, because we're in inferential testing mode, what we're trying to see is if the difference between these sample statistics are large enough that the difference between these groups are unlikely, assuming that the null is true so we can go ahead and reject it. In one sample mode, we had a difference, and we were trying to see if the difference from that sample was so different from its population that it could not appear by chance alone. So in this case, we're moving the population aside to focus on two groups and seeing if the difference between those two groups is large enough that they're unlikely to be uh, trivial. So the assumptions that we're dealing with here are that we want to have two and only two independent random samples. If we have more than two samples, we're going to have to turn to ANOVAs and other tests later that we'll be introducing you to. But for now, we're going to look at just two sample groups. We want to make sure that our independence level measure is interval ratio. These are our numerical groups here. We also want to make sure that the independent dichotomous variable for the group membership is such that we can only select for two subgroups in case it's something like uh, different M&M colors. We're only going to pick two M&M colors, not the full array. Uh, also, we, we assume that the sampling distribution is normal following the central limit theorem. And lastly, that the population variances are equal. This isn't so much of a concern at the z-test, but it is for the t-test, and we're going to talk more about population variances in a future video. Side note, everything I just said here about the assumptions is applying to the means version. Population testing follows closely, but we'll show differences when we get to its video there. Now with the two sample test process, this is a very similar process to the inferential testing we do more broadly. It's just specific for the Z's and T's. So we start by formulating our hypotheses. We prepare and check the conditions. Do we meet all of our various test assumptions? We set an alpha level because you always set alpha at the beginning of your study, not once you go ahead and start calculating your p-values. You go ahead and calculate your t-score. Figure out if the Z or the T obtained is greater than or less than or equal to the Z critical values associated with the alpha you've identified or find the p-value for that t-score and compare it to your alpha. Then calculate your significance and interpret your results. Now with the independent samples t-test, I said before that the groups are different. So we can see these as example by men and women, treatment A or treatment B, a control group and a treatment group, and we assume that these groups are uncorrelated. The values in one particular group aren't going to be affecting the values of a second group, that they're independent. And we can use this framework to figure out if there's a difference. Now, when we look at the mathematics behind these, let's start with the z-test version. And we assume that there's no difference, that these differences are zero. And so if there's no differences between them at the population level, our mu's in the numerator are going to go ahead and cancel out. But we still have our samples to contend with. So in the numerator, we keep x bar of group 1 minus x bar of group 2. And in the denominator, we have standard errors of the groups. And this is going to translate into the sigma squared over n 
for each group. Note that they are separate in their divisions and they are adding them together and then taking the square root. This is a process of what we call pooled estimates where we are combining information from both samples in order to create our standard error. Now when we switch over to the t-test version, which is very similar to the z, it's the same formula except we're switching out sigmas for s's to represent sample standard deviation. We also go ahead and incorporate that there's a degrees of freedom. The z-test version does not contain degrees of freedom where the t-test version does. And the degrees of freedom for a two sample test is n of group 1 plus n of group 2 minus 2. If this seems a little weird to you, just keep in mind that the one sample test degrees of freedom was n minus 1. So now we've got two samples. So think of it as n minus 1 of group 1 plus n minus 1 of group 2. Put together the math on that and you get n of group 1 plus n of group 2 minus 2. And it's the same. So when we're looking at this for the two sample t-test and we want to figure out how does it work, keep in mind that the t-statistic itself is a ratio. It's a ratio of the difference between the two groups divided by some amount of standard error based on that difference. And what are the sort of features that can influence this? Well, the larger the difference in means in the numerator, that's going to give you a heavier top-heavy numerator and a larger t-score. Larger t-score is going to be more likely to be statistically significant and say that these differences are not appearing by chance alone. Similarly, the size of the sample variances. So the larger the sample variance, the larger your standard error, and the larger standard error, the smaller the t-score. Or the smaller the, the, sta the standard error and the variance, then the smaller the differences and the smaller the t-score. And also plays a role in this as well. So again, just to kind of recap on degrees of freedom, that these are the number of values in some vector of data that are allowed to vary inside of your model. And then moving to just kind of recap into the independent sample t-test for significance, start by assuming that the null is true. And in the two-tail version, we are looking for regions that we can reject the null on both the left tail and the right tail, higher and lower values. Keep in mind that with this particular distribution curve, it's still centered at zero, but it's not assuming some population mean at zero. Instead, it's saying the difference between the two means is zero. So mean of group one minus mean of group two is zero. And we're seeing how far is the standardized value from that zero. And if you're in the lower tail, then you want to get a t-score that is smaller than your critical value. If you're in the upper tail, you want to get a t-score that's greater than your t-score. Critical t. Sorry. And conversely, you can also check your p-value and your alpha. If your p-value is greater than your alpha, then you fail to reject the null. But if it is smaller than your alpha, then you're okay, and you can go ahead and reject the null. That middle ground region is the area that we cannot reject the null. If we're looking in the one-tail version, it's similar, but we are stacking our alpha value into all of one tail, either the upper or the lower. And so you're going to need to make sure you're looking at the specific t critical value or z critical value that's associated with your upper tail or lower tail. And they are going to be different than the two-tail version, those critical values, because of the extra probability pushed into the particular tail. Let's go ahead and do a real quick mathematical example. We'll do the full hypothesis test in a future video, but we'll just do a quick math example on what I call the Battle of the Vampire Sagas. And we're going to use Rotten Tomato data to see if the critics on Rotten Tomatoes, if there's a difference between how much they like Twilight or Underworld. And because we're only having an N of 10, there's five movies in each saga, we're going to go ahead and use an alpha of 0 0.10. So the critic scores for Twilight are 49, 28, 48, 25, and 49, with a mean score of 39.8. The Underworld movies are scored 31, 16, 29, 27, and 30, with a mean score of 24.6. At the mean values, we can see that they definitely seem to prefer Twilight over Underworld, 39.8 to 24.6. But this is a statistically significant difference. So we can go ahead, and I'm going to use a T score here, just because we've got a really small sample size. And remember from our previous videos in the first sample that the t-curve approximates the z-curve as n grows larger. So if we would have had a larger sample size, it really wouldn't matter which one that we're doing, the z's or the t's. But in this case, I'm going to do t because it's a smaller sample. And so what we have here are the 39.8 minus 24.6 in the numerator. And then in the denominator, I've gone ahead and calculated using the same critic scores the standard deviation squared, or variance, and the sample size for them. And when I calculate that out, I get a t-score of 
2.47 rounded. I can take that information and go look up on a t-table to find my critical value. And with five movies in each group, that's a total of 10 movies, minus two is eight degrees of freedom. So I'll look at eight on the rows and I'll cross-reference that with the two-tail alpha of 0.10 in the columns. And that's gonna give me a critical value of 1.86. 1.86. Now again, the t-table is in absolute terms, but in this case, we can just go ahead and we're looking at a two-tailed test anyways. So we, as long as our score is greater than 1.86 or lower than negative 1.86, we would be fine with that. Now I'm gonna give you a real quick snapshot here of how we can find these same values just looking in R so we don't need the t-table. And if you wanna get the critical value, we're using the function QT. And inside QT, we first give it the t statistic test statistic that we obtained, 2.47, comma the degrees of freedom, and it'll tell me that the t critical value associated with that is 1.859 rounded. And if I wanna get the p value, I do two times because we're doing a two-tail test. If it's one tail, I can leave off the two times. pt is the function to get the probability. On the negative absolute value of the t statistic, that's just a pro tip, so you don't have to keep worrying about which direction your t score is in and then comma for eight degrees of freedom, and it tells us that we have a probability of 0.038 rounded. I always recommend that you draw out a curve if you're somewhat new to this idea or you're just kind of working your way through a test. So I draw out a T distribution curve and I shade in regions on both sides. My alpha is 0.10, so I'm gonna put 0 0.05 in either side, and it's corresponding with a negative T critical value of negative 1.86 and a positive 1.86. And then I go ahead and draw in a line of where my t-score is at of 2.47. And I'm definitely into the critical value shaded region in the upper tail. So I am going to be statistically significant. I'm going to be able to reject the null and say that the critics do differ in their opinions based on which movies they like better or worse on average with Twilight and Underworld. Now, when I want to go ahead and report t results in APA, this is going to be the same sort of result reporting, whether you're in one sample or two sample. So it's standard for all T tests. But you put in the T, just the letter T, in parentheses the degrees of freedom, equals the T statistic you've obtained, comma, P value, and then is it less than your alpha if you're statistically significant, greater than your alpha if you're not statistically significant, or you can choose to equal the P value you actually have as long as it's rounded within two decimal places, and uh, it's fine. If you've got a long decimal uh, p-value, you're gonna be better off using p is less than your alpha. And so how could we go ahead and use that data to write up our vampire statistics? Go ahead and pause the video for a minute or go back a moment to see what our statistics were looking like. And I'll be here waiting. Okay, so just to kind of jump back and give you the answer, we have T with eight degrees of freedom in parentheses equals 2.47, and then P was less than our alpha of 0.10. And that sums up our introduction to the independent samples test. I'll see you all in the next video where we extend into confidence intervals and uh, talk about variance.